Well, welcome back to another episode of Dylan J Dance. I'm Dylan J Dance, and today I'll be Dylan J Dance. Or DJ Dance, if you prefer. What's happening, guys? Welcome back. It's been a while. Hope you enjoy the new setup. Got a new mic, new setup, new beard, new me. Let me know down under what you think of it all. Uh, this could be a little bit better quality, but there's a bit of noise suppression on because this laptop is so damn noisy. I need a better computer. I need like a proper PC because I want to do some Twitch streaming. That's why I'm trying this sort of setup. And hopefully this setup eliminates my editing bottleneck, which I have. It, it's why it takes so long to make videos. Editing is a pain in my ass. So I'm hoping I don't have to do any more editing really with this. Um, what else did I want to get out there? Oh, I'm going to try uh, Twitch streaming. So come follow me on Twitch. I'll put the link in the bio. I want to try and do this live. You guys can ask questions or like request things to react to. I thought that could be fun. Um, and then I also want to play some games, but I need a better PC. So, you know, maybe come support me on Patreon or something. Uh, I need some monies. Uh, what else? Uh, I also just saw that Game of Thrones, the King Lannister, his real life name is Robert Dance. So your boy is technically a Lannister. And a Lannister always pays his debts. I don't know where I'm going with that one. But anyway, um, there was something else I wanted to say. I'm also going to try uh, making some different videos, like non-physics videos. So hopefully they're okay. I'm just, you know, I don't want to say stuff before I do it. But I just want to warn you guys, okay? So there could be some different styles, different styled videos coming up. Anyway, let's get into it. If you're new around here, please subscribe. Go click on that button, click the click it again so it notifies you. Uh, I'm going to be trying videos every second day, okay? They're going to be coming at you, so keep an eye out. And if you like the video, that would also be appreciated. Okay, I've got to change the screen, don't I? So let me just double check that's happened because I don't want to film this entire video uh, and it not work. There we go. All right, the universe iceberg explained. It's a long one. So I was just getting the uh, mic all set up. So let's check it out. To oh dear, oh dear. Okay, here we go. Iceberg chart. Thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. We'll talk more about Squarespace later in the video. You know them. They got the popular information at the top, and the sure. obscure and unknown information at the bottom. Today, okay. I'll be showing you an iceberg chart about the universe. Pretty big topic, I know. So let's get started. Huge, pretty big. Universe iceberg chart stars. Okay. If you live on Earth and you're a human, pretty sure I do. Probably pretty sure I'm a human. Or even seen a star. If you haven't, <laughs> stars are basically huge balls of Who glass hasn't seen a star, bro? Undergoing fusion, which creates a ton of energy and light and radiation. Yes. The planet you're Indeed. most likely on, the Earth, is actually orbiting around a star that we call the Sun, which technically doesn't look like this. Yeah, now so we get it. The Sun isn't technically orange and yellow. Now, can you please shut the fuck? Once you put enough of these stars together, you get <sighs> galaxies. Galaxies are basically groups of stars and some other stuff, which in most cases are orbiting around a supermassive black hole, we think. They're pretty big. Uh, no, we're pretty sure about that one. It's all, the, most of them orbit supermassive black holes. Pretty much all of them. And there's a lot more going Say, on, but you probably what's what he says. Know all this, so let's just move on. No. Uh, there's a lot more to galaxies than just that. So, for instance, what about all the dark matter? You know, that's kind of holding galaxies together really because this they should really be flying apart uh, but they don't so there must be dark matter uh you know surrounding galaxies we call them dark matter halos uh, there's all these problems with galaxies like the rotation curve problem you might have heard about how you know on the edges of galaxies it they should be rotating a lot slower than what we actually observe that on the on the outsides on the outskirts of galaxies they're actually you know moving around the central you know part of the galaxy way too quick uh it doesn't make a lot of sense so there must be a lot of mass out there causing you know this g giving this extra energy but anyway let's keep going now chances are if you went to school you probably have at least heard about the big bang the Big Bang is a theory no. that the universe stems from a tiny little speck of super high pressure matter which immediately expanded into what we call the universe. And I'll talk more about this later. Good enough. 
Good enough. Gravity is a natural phenomenon that brings everything, matter and energy, together. If you are a thing in the universe, you have likely experienced this natural phenomenon before. In fact, you're probably experiencing it right now. Fun well, fact, you are not technically that's not what gravity is, but he is on level one, so I, I, I feel like he's going to get to, you know, what gravity really is later also on. also attracting Earth to you, since all matter has gravitational force. Newtonian physics. Speed of light. The speed of light is a physical constant of 300 million meters a second. The uh, speed... It's actually 299,792,458 meters a second. Nerd. Right. Anyway. The speed of light is, according to special relativity, the highest speed that matter, energy, and information can travel. Yes. This means that no matter how hard you try, with our current understanding of physics, you cannot go faster than this. Why? Well, because it's also actually the speed of causality. If you break the speed of causality, things don't make sense. Things would be happening in, you know, like reverse or, you know, outcomes would be happening before there's a cause. Cause and effect breaks. That's why you can't break the speed of light. So, not many people seem to say that. The observable because universe. travels at the speed of light and the universe has only been around for about 13.8 billion years, this means that there are parts of the universe that are so far that it would take light longer than the universe has existed to reach us. This it's actually most of the universe now. The empirical region that has had time to reach us is called the observable universe. As in, well, no, technically what I said is wrong. It's like if you want to travel to most of the universe right now, traveling at the speed of light, you couldn't make it um, because, yes, everything is expanding and it's accelerating in its expansion. So if you were to travel out at the speed of light towards, and this depends on which reference frame you're in, okay? Let's not get too bogged down, okay? Let's just <laughs> pretend, you know, you understand what I'm saying. And uh, yeah, so I think it's like 97 or 99% of the universe is kind of out of our reach right now, even if you traveled at the speed of light, which is kind of scary. Uh, and then at what he was talking about, the edge of the observable universe, there's stuff that's constantly crossing this region, which will be forever out of our reach. Um, anyway. Remember that Big Bang thing I talked about earlier? Yeah. Turns out it's not actually an explosion, it's more like the expansion of the entire universe itself. When we think about the Big Bang, that's we not think true. about a Big Bang. Matter condensed to a tiny little state and then exploding out into the universe. But actually, the Big Bang was the entire universe itself, and it was the universe that expanded enormously, causing the Big Bang. No. The universe this is still expanding to this day, it's but just... it's not using word Expansion junk. in the sense that the universe is increasing in size with the middle. No, that would be way too simple and convenient. Instead, look at it like this. Imagine a balloon with points drawn onto it. Now imagine that you are a two-dimensional being on this balloon. When looking at these points, you would see every point expand away from each other. Oh, and uh, did I mention that the universe expands faster than the speed of light? So that was a good analogy. That's the one they always give you. Um, anyway, yeah, let's continue. Atoms are the smallest unit ah, of matter. That's, I was, he was talking about the Big Bang. He said a lot of stuff that's just straight up wrong. Uh, I think he's referring to inflation, which is actually, with current understanding, depending on who you talk to, uh, you know, we think it happened before the Big Bang. That's right. Something happened before the Big Bang. It's called inflation. Uh, and we don't know how it began. We don't know if it began, you know, it started from a singularity. All we can say for sure is, you know, the universe inflated, <laughs> according to our current understanding, okay? It inflated exponentially quickly, uh, like really quickly. And then the Big Bang occurred, which was kind of like a dumping of energy into, you know, this place that now existed somehow. <laughs> yeah. Look, we're not going to pretend like we understand really what's going on, but we can kind of tell you about the physics of the situation, okay? And it's cool as hell, so, you know, shut up, bro. We're trying our best. In case you weren't aware, every Very physical small. thing pretty in small. daily life is made of atoms. All atoms have a nucleus and some electrons orbiting around it. The nucleus itself yes. is made of protons and neutrons, and by changing the nucleus, you can get different atoms. If you combine these atoms, you can get different molecules and chemical compounds. The word atom originally means indivisible particle, but as it turns out, that is not the case. 
subatomic. Subatomic particles are particles even smaller than the atoms. The neutrons and protons we talked about are subatomic particles, but the neutrons and protons themselves are actually made of quarks. Mm -hmm. There are six total flavors. Yes, they're called flavors of quarks, but there are also some leptons, Strange and Gauss charm. bosons, and uh, Higgs bosons. Anyway, they're small. That's all you gotta remember. All right. Let's zoom out a little for the subatomic incoming. particles. And oh no, we zoomed out too fast and accidentally created a black hole. But what even is a black hole? Well, a black hole what is, is a small hole? little region of space that weighs so much and is so dense that gravity is so strong that nothing can escape from it. Now, I know what you're thinking. Yeah, that's you fine. can't say weight. No, weight and mass are different things. Weight depends on... Uh, well, I mean, technically, it's right, really. You know, because weight is like, depends on you know, the gravity that you're in. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of mass there. It's a lot of density. So, yeah, good enough, all right? Uh, and yeah, that's... You, it might sound strange, but that's pretty. That's a pretty good <laughs> description of our understanding of what black holes are. We really don't understand them, and you see a lot of stuff online. But there's just a lot of theoretical stuff out there. Okay, we what's going on beyond the event horizon? We have no idea. Our physics really doesn't tell us. It kind of breaks. But what is it? Is it a hole? Is it just a really dense sphere of stuff? Don't know, bro. Well, have you ever heard of what are they called? A f fluff ball? <laughs> No, wait, in string theory, uh, fuzzball, that's what they're called. So, in string theory, uh, black holes might actually not be what we think they are. They could be these things called fuzzballs, which are like these areas where these giant strings, you know, like from string theory, uh, get all twisted and knotted. Uh, and I think there's been some theoretical work to show that they would behave somewhat like a black hole, but... Uh, there would be somewhat of a surface, I'm pretty sure, from memory. Um, and, you know, it's not like this wormhole to another universe or something like that. But I've always just loved the name, Fuzzball. <laughs> you know, for the most terrifying thing in the universe, that is not a very fitting name, <laughs> Fuzzball. So, I think it's a good name for a dog, you know, because a terrifying little dog. Anyway, let's keep going. If you haven't already, why not start a Squarespace website? It's never been easier. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is an all-in-one platform that'll allow you to create a beautiful online presence and run your business. Via our partnership, we offer a year-long comp service. Take advantage of this for your read as well as for yourself. They have all sorts of really cool features, one of which I think is really cool is their member-only content. They're called Squarespace Member Areas, and you can connect with your audience, and with the content you provide on it, you can generate revenue. You can also manage your members, send email communications, and leverage audience insights all in one easy platform. Another great feature of Squarespace are the email campaigns. You can grow and engage with your audience through these Squarespace email campaigns, and they allow you to create content that matches your website your logo, existing products, blog posts, so your messaging is consistent and effective. And finally, another great feature of Squarespace is that you can collect donations. You can support your cause by gathering contributions with PayPal, Apple Pay, Stripe, and Venmo. Check out squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash Dylan J Dance to get 10% off your first purchase on a website or domain. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Also, go send me some TikToks on Instagram. According to general Black relativity, holes. we have what is called a gravitational singularity. Imagine... Which really just... That's not really true. You know, some of the equations in Einsteinian physics blow up. They go to infinity. Uh, so, you know, some people call that a singularity. Others say that just means the equations break, you know. So, usually when you come across singularities in... Uh, physics in the history of physics, at least, it usually means uh, our we have some kind of misunderstanding, and then someone comes along, gets rid of the infinities, and voila, we have a new theory. But you know, in saying that, that there is some infinities we can deal with in like quantum field theory. Uh, yeah, let's not get into that. Let's keep going. Not a black sphere of matter, but a point. A single dot in space that has infinite mass and gravitational field. You Did he say, say a black hole? No, he's talking about singularities. Of normal space -time. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It, it does. 
When you look at a black hole, you actually see the event horizon, which is the area where light cannot escape, not the black hole itself. Also, if you jump into a black hole, you will get stretched If out. you want to know where that comes from, it's just because like the escape velocity becomes uh, you know, greater than the speed of light, which means you can't get out because you can't move f through space-time faster than the speed of light, right? That's what the, the, the event horizon is. You know, you might be wondering like, what the hell is this region? What's so special about it? Well, that's it. You won't even really know that you've crossed it because it's like if you were to come up across it, there's nothing special happening. There's no like line. Um, but, you know, you, you're you definitely going to die well before that, uh, especially if it's a small black hole. There'll be enormous amounts of energy from hawking radiation for very small black. We don't know, we don't know if these really small black holes exist. They might. Uh, there's a number of mechanisms by which they might exist. You know, maybe that's what dark matter is. These, there, there might be these things called primordial black holes that, you know, have, were formed, you know, during the formation of the universe, and that are still around possibly. Uh, and then the really big black holes, they have some Hawking radiation, but it's a lot less. Uh, and the way you would die, yeah, you'd probably get spaghettified, which I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've heard about, but you can't forget the heat. Yeah. But anyway, let's keep going. This is, and I'm not even kidding, called spaghettification. Ah. Uh, ha ha. But how does a black hole appear? Yeah, I don't laugh a lot in my videos. People always get on my back. They're like, you're a psycho man. Why aren't you laughing? I'm just not much of a laugh. I'm a smiler. So maybe I need to implement, employ uh, an Elon Musk. Ha ha. Have you ever noticed when Elon Musk in like interviews and stuff and he doesn't really laugh. He just goes... Haha. <laughs> I really think he does that so people don't think he's a psychopath. Because yeah, I might just steal that. I think it's a it's a good one. So the Australian psycho. Where did it well, come from? Once stars well, spun out, the energy of the fusion it was creating is no longer keeping it from imploding, and the stars implodes into one of three stellar remnants. A white dwarf, a black quite. hole, or that was pretty it's good enough, okay? I don't want to keep stopping this. Uh, yeah, okay, fine. The neutron star. Yeah, when the star's the over star a certain mass. It has about 20 to 25 solar masses. That's because, I will, I will tell you this, it has to be over a certain mass to form a black hole uh, or a neutron star because the, the more massive stars have enough mass to uh, fuse the heavier elements. And once you get to iron, that's when this huge supernova uh, process happens where it collapses back in on itself because uh, iron actually takes energy. Uh, but anyway, um, so yeah, if you don't have enough mass, you can't fuse the heavier elements and then so you can't get to that supernova event, you know. Uh, our star, not big enough, it will explode the outer layers at least, in a, what's called a nova. And then this it'll explode off this thing which we call a planetary nebula, which is a terrible name because it's not a planet. But, you know, that stuff will may eventually form planets. I think that's the idea behind it. So, yeah. And then with our star, it'll just become a white dwarf, which is what we kind of call a dead star. Even though, you know, there's still something there. It's really just the core of our star that remains, which will burn on for a lot longer, a lot longer. And yeah, let's keep going. We could talk about neutron stars and black holes all day long. Comes a neutron star. Excluding black holes, they are the densest stellar object we know of. Neutron a teaspoon of neutron star weighs as much as Mount Everest. I should say that's the same amount of mass. Neutron stars have incredible properties. The craziest of which is the fact that the inner crust of a neutron star is called nuclear pasta. <laughs> yes. You probably neutron degeneracy about. pressure, where everything is so close together, the neutrons are almost touching. Uh, there's all these forces in atoms, uh, and that's, you know, if, if, if you try and bring neutrons, like, so they're, like, all touching, that takes a lot of energy. There's a lot of strong forces that stop that from happening. And then if you go beyond that, if you, if you push... The neutrons, so they like start overlapping into each other. Well, that's how you get a black hole, and it just like everything breaks. And the universe is like, nope, not doing that. <laughs> but the planets of the inner and outer solar system. But it may surprise you to hear that there are actually a ton of other objects in our solar system. 
Objects that are further than Neptune are called trans-Neptunian objects. The most popular of these is the exoplanet Pluto, but there is also the dwarf Pluto. planet Iris, which is more massive than Pluto, Homia, which is formed like a potato, and Maki Maki, which has an average temperature of 40 Kelvin. One. And the last two were discovered Kelvin. in 2004 and 2005. Potato Maki Maki. Theory of relativity. The theory of relativity is a theory that you've likely heard at? about before. Level the theory two. of relativity is comprised of the special relativity theory and the general relativity theory. Okay. Let's start with special relativity. Special relativity uh, is based on two postulates. One, all of physics are identical for all frames of reference if they are in constant speed. Imagine you're on a train. When the train starts, you can feel that you're pushed back into your seat. But once the train is at a constant speed, you're only really being pushed around. What you feel is not the speed of the train, but instead the acceleration of the train. Right now, you're on the surface of the Earth. At the equator of the Earth, the Earth's rotation is about 1670 kilometers per hour. But because the speed of the Earth's rotation isn't changing, we don't feel it. 2. The speed of light in vacuum is identical for all observers, regardless of how the source is moving. Explain the speed of light is a constant. Complicated. Basically, the speed <laughs> of light is a constant, and this was revolutionary at the time. Here's a full explanation if you're interested, you can pause the video and read it. Oh, and by the way, this violates Newtonian physics, because why not? The second sure theory does. of relativity is the general relativity theory. The general relativity describes gravity and is our current interpretation of gravity in modern physics. The general relativity theory essentially states that space-time curves when there is matter, energy, and momentum creating gravity. When he says so creating gravity, time. it is gravity. The curvature of space-time itself is gravity. Scientists were looking around in space and were like, huh. It looks like there should be around five times more matter here. <laughs> Otherwise, the galaxy would just fly apart. As I was saying. Maybe there's actually matter, but we can't see it. What? What are you trying to say? Maybe this matter we can't see is in a way dark, so we can't see the matter. Sure. You know? What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> so a new theory was born. Yeah. Dark matter is thought to account for about 85% of all matter in the universe, and is more of a theoretical type of matter rather than an actual one we've discovered. If it does exist, it is a form of matter that pretty much only interacts with I'm not sure I'd say theoretical. Like, there, there's a lot of evidence for it that we can measure through the... Because it interacts uh, gravitationally. It doesn't interact with any other forces. Uh, so, that's why it's invisible. It doesn't really interact with electromagnetism at all. But anyway. Any day now. Radiation and other matter through gravity. Make it fairly exceptional and unexplainable. Cool guy award. Dark matter is not to be confused with dark energy. The theory of dark energy, similar to the theory Straight of dark of matter, seeks to give an explanation to the missing energy in the universe. Dark energy is said to contribute to 69% of all energy <laughs> in the observable universe. 69. And unlike dark matter, we have observed evidence of its existence from measurements of supernova. Okay, so when he says the missing energy of the universe, what he means there is that the universe is. is is expanding. We've known that At since Harvard Hubble. Business School, we Shut have up, a unique man. approach to online. Shut up. So the universe is expanding. We've known that since Hubble, since he looked out and saw that. For some reason, all the galaxies are, most of them are moving away from us. Uh, and then along come a team not so long ago and realized this expansion is, exact, is actually accelerating. And so, to explain this acceleration, we just invented this thing called dark energy. And in theoretical physics, it does kind of nicely pop out uh, of some stuff, you know, Einstein kind of showed. Anyway, we're not going to talk about this. You've probably heard it, all about it. I don't want to talk about things you probably already know. So, that'll do it, okay? Oh. You've probably already heard of antimatter before. Yes. It's often mentioned in science fiction, but... What is it? It's completely real. Well, antimatter is matter composed of antiparticles. I'm kidding. I know this isn't very descriptive. Look at it like <laughs> this. Every particle has an antiparticle with the exact same mass, but with the opposite charge. But what does it have to do with antimatter? Well, as I said earlier, antimatter is matter made exclusively out of these antiparticles. Mm -hmm. But here's the cool stuff. When a particle comes in contact with this antiparticle, a ton of energy is released. This explosion is remarkable because the amount of energy released proportional to its mass is the highest amount we have ever observed. To understand why it's remarkable, you must first understand E equals mc squared. You've likely seen this equation before and it basically states that all mass equals an amount of energy. 
This means that, in theory, one kilogram will always be equal to an amount of energy, regardless of where that mass comes from. So if you still think antimatter is kind of like sci-fi, well, have you ever heard of a PET scan? No, not something you scan your pets with. They're at uh, doctors use these, uh, you know, some like medical devices. Then, you know, like MRIs, they're not like MRIs, but I'm just saying, you know, you've probably heard of an MRI. Uh, and PET, it's, I'm pretty sure it stands for like positron electron tomography or some shit. Anyway, it's using antimatter concepts, okay? Positron. Positron is an antiparticle, the antiparticle of an electron. This means that one kilogram of dirt and one kilogram of enriched uranium is equal to, on paper, the exact same amount of energy. The only reason why enriched uranium is what we're using to power our light bulbs is because it has certain properties that makes it easier to do so, but that's it. That is, in this context, the only thing that separates mm. the two. The mm. big challenge when it comes to generating electricity is that it's hard to extract energy out of matter. We typically end up with very small amounts of energy compared to the amount of mass we put in. Let's take coal for example. One kilogram of coal gives back the equivalent of this much kilograms of energy, which means that about th this percent uh, of its do. mass gets converted into energy. That's a lot of zeros. Mm -hmm. Uranium has an efficiency of 0.1%, which although much higher, is still not much mass getting converted into energy. This is where antimatter is interesting, because it has an efficiency of 1%, 100%. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it currently requires way more energy to make antimatter than you get out of it. Mm -hmm. That's like a trillion dollars. Wormholes are a theoretical structure or... I don't think... I can't remember if that's correct. But yeah, it's very hard to make. We don't have... You have to isolate it from, you know, normal stuff. So good luck with that. Which connects different points in space. When we think of the universe, we often think of some flat plane or some three-dimensional cubical box, but that might not be the case. If the wormhole theory is correct, a wormhole would be able to bend space-time in the fourth dimension. Wormhole theory. Pretty... It's not a thing. It just comes out of uh, general relativity. Hard to imagine a four-dimensional universe. Let's imagine that the universe, as we perceive it, is two-dimensional instead of three-dimensional. Let's say that we have two points and we want to travel from here to here. But that's a pretty far trip. Luckily, scientists in this universe have been able to create a wormhole, and in this regular example, the wormholes would essentially bend the universe into the third dimension, like so, connecting two points. From our perspective, since we see the universe in two dimensions, it would look like a Every sci-fi movie ever. Basically yes, transporting us to the other side of the universe. So if you add Two's one more dimension, wormhole. you have a simplified version of the wormhole theory. Okay. So inaccurate, but whatever, man. Epochs are a way to whatever. The history of the universe into different epochs. As we talked about earlier, the universe began with the Big Bang. Here begins the first epoch. Inflation. In the beginning, we had the very early universe, which itself is comprised of six epochs. The very early universe was very weird, and the fundamental forces of the universe were combined Theoretic. together. At this point, we're in the early universe. The universe is full of super hot quark plasma, and the quarks turn into protons quark and neutrons. Quark gluon plasma. After approximately two minutes, nuclear fusion starts Sounds to like a good name for a drink, doesn't it? Protons are making new atoms. Then, uh, not much. After about a hundred thousand years, the temperature finally allowed for some of the first molecules. There was a lot of stuff in between then, the by the way. Two hundred to three hundred million years. The universe wow, became what we call okay. the Dark Ages. Just right until the first stars started to appear, which meant the creation. So he just skipped over when the micro background radiation was released, but we'll skip that um, because I've talked about it a lot in previous videos. But that was an important point. Found up new different molecules. After about 700 million years, the first galaxies started to pop up. We think. And among these were ours, the Milky Way. Because it's a massive About 9.2 billion years after the Big Bang. There's a lot of born. still stuff uh, we don't know surrounding all those early periods. But with that new telescope, James Webb, hopefully it can uh, you know, shed some light, open a new window to the universe. And we might be able to see the very first galaxies and the first stars. Uh, because, yeah, we really don't understand how some of these galaxies got so big so quickly and how some of these supermassive black holes within these super big galaxies got so big so quickly as well. We don't understand it. It kind of defies our understanding of physics. And the rest is history. What a story, huh? 
But what <laughs> happened before and after the Big Bang? Greatest story ever told. Is, but no one knows what happened before the Big Bang, and we can only guess what will happen in the very distant future. I do, but if I told you, I'd have to kill you. There are lots of different guesses as to what could happen. Let's go through them. The first You're gonna is die, that bro. the expansion of the universe will eventually reverse. This theory is called the Big Crunch, and it essentially states that our universe will contract all the way back and the Big Bang will repeat. A more specific version of the Big Crunch is the Big Bounce theory, which says that this sequence will repeat indefinitely. The second, more widely accepted theory of the universe is that the universe won't start contracting. This can either mean one or two things. One, the universe will keep expanding at an ever increasing rate like it does right now, and eventually events like the Big Rip will occur where the universe will have expanded so much that all matter down to the quantum scale will be ripped apart. Also, the Big Freeze where the expansion of the universe will gradually slow down until all energy in the universe will be evenly distributed. Motion and activity generally means that energy is being transferred from one object to another, but since all energy is evenly distributed, nothing can happen, and the universe will just be particles floating in space. This theory is also known as the universe heat death. Pretty good. Pretty good. Let's say Which we is have very two related objects, to entropy. and they have a total energy of 10 energy back units. To now, let's say that the energy units are distributed randomly between them. If each energy unit has a 50% chance of being in either one of the objects, then, odds are, they will probably be somewhat evenly distributed. In other words, the chance of one object having all the energy is low. The larger the objects are, and the higher the amount of energy is, the more likely they are to be evenly distributed. If you have a mug of coffee and some ice next to it, then through simple probability, the energy will move towards an even distribution. This force is in reality just a result of randomness and probability and has a large impact on our universe. Mm. Mm. Pulsars are stars, typically neutron stars, that emit radiation from their magnetic poles. Always Pulsars neutron form stars. The core of the star is about to be collapsed into a neutron star. The star's angular momentum is retained by the forming neutron star, but since the neutron star is way smaller, it has an enormously high rotation speed. How fast does it rotate? Well, but. let's have a look. The fastest spinning pulsar is PSR J1748244680. Pretty creative. It rotates 716 times per second. Because pulsar It sounds crazy, but they are on like average 20 kilometers in diameter, which is tiny when you think about how big the sun is, which can fit like 1.3 million Earths within it. Then you have these pulsars, 20 kilometers diameter. That's like something you can imagine, a small little town. Um, and I, I just want to say that they're, they're called a neutron star and a pulsar are the same thing. They're called a pulsar when that thing up there, you can see that beam. Uh, is pointed at us and it's called a pulsar because you know it flashes us as you know it goes you know through the line of sight anyway think about that for a second a star rotating 716 times per second Small i can't even give thing. this video enough frames still, per still second crazy. to show you just how fast that is <laughs> it's very fast anyway if you stood on the surface of this neutron star, you would be going 70,000 kilometers per second. That's 24% the speed of light. Yeah. It's pretty So, great. as I was about to say, because pulsars are very magnetic and compact, their high rotation speeds create beams of electromagnetic radiation. Mm -hmm. a highly radioactive ray. Speaking of which... It's from all the swirling gamma magnetic ray fields. bursts are a ray of extremely energetic electromagnetic radiation. Gamma ray bursts typically come from either a black hole or a neutron star, like we talked about earlier. If a gamma ray burst were to hit the Earth, it's safe to say the consequences would not be so. We would all die. It would be bad. <laughs> I can't remember the estimates of how. The Godfrey Stop Take Sale is uh, gamma ray burst would need Wertime to be. carpet shampoo and now only um, one seventy nine. Save one twenty. Salvatechnic stick vacuum now only. Anyway. I think it would only take like mechanics on four gamma ray bursts within our galaxy from memory to hit like most of the galaxy, which is, you know, like a hundred thousand light years in diameter. So they're, you know, they're pretty powerful. It's 25,000 light years. So it must be about that. 
Quantum mechanics are notoriously hard to understand. Death limit. Later in this video, I will talk about some effects and observations about quantum mechanics. So all you gotta know for now is that quantum mechanics is the science of what goes on in the realm of the... So this universe iceberg explained, you know, like he's getting to quantum now. But if you want to understand a lot of that stuff he's already talked about, you need to understand quantum. You know, we didn't... The way, you know, we discovered neutron stars, um, pretty much everything is by applying you know, quantum mechanics to what we see. And what do we see when we look out in the universe? We see light. You know, that's all we see. Now we have this new window on the universe, gravity. But light is all we've ever had. And, you you know, to understand what you're looking at in the light, it's quantum mechanics. You got to, when you're breaking stuff into spectra and identifying stuff on the spectra, well, that involves quantum mechanics. But anyway, there's a lot of fundamental tests as well we do on fundamental physics through astrophysics uh and so obviously if you want to be an astrophysicist you need to understand quantum you know uh you're, you're still a physicist at the end of the day anyway we're not talking regular small here we're talking sizes smaller than atoms it turns out things get pretty weird once you reach that scale and quantum mechanics is the science of what goes on in there the basic principles of quantum mechanics and what makes it weird are a couple of different things First of all, you cannot describe the location of a particle with certainty. We have a margin of error, and this margin of error is called the uncertainty principle, and has some pretty weird implications. Second of all, well, particles and it's not necessarily that true. Yes, the uncertainty principle is like incredibly important. But when he said you can't describe its location precisely, well, you, you, you can, but um, then you can't know a bunch of other things about it. So, like its momentum, uh, you, you probably heard about these conjugate pairs, how you can't know two, these two things at once. Uh, but knowing more of one makes the other more uncertain. Anyway, we've talked about that before. It's Their way more complicated point. than that, like what the uncertainty principle truly is. But, you know, a cool takeaway from it is that the universe is kind of fundamentally uh, random at the smallest scales. So, you know, when people are always carrying on about, like, you know, no such thing as luck. You make your own luck, man. These guys don't understand quantum mechanics. God is playing dice. On the quantum scale, weird to say the least. Particles behave pretty both weird. like a wave and a particle. This is pretty complicated and weird. We say this, but it's not exactly accurate because you know what's really going on is not. It's 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 a wave, but it's not really a wave. Like we just say it's a wave because it's the closest analogy we can think of that somewhat makes sense. But you know quantization is not a wave like what's happening it's just a conceptual way to like imagine it my opinion it. best example of this is the double slit experiment let's mm, say we have a screen this screen with two slits now if we point a light to these slits we will see a wave like pattern emerge on the other side yeah but that's not quantum mechanics that's just light right have some patience will you Anyway, let's do the same, Everything but this quantum time mechanics. let's do it with some grains of sand. Each grain of sand would either go through slit 1 or slit 2, and we will see two piles of sand emerge. Please just shut the f- Alright, are you following? Let's say we have a sort of atom gun that can throw atom individual gun. atoms at a time. If we repeat this experiment, but we block off one of the slits, we can see the atoms spread out like this. So far, so good, that's, that's normal, that's fine. Alright, now let's open the other slit again, and- what? This is the same interference that we got with light. So basically, the particles move like particles when we have one slit, but move like waves when we have a second slit? Okay. Uh, okay, but how can they move like waves when they're individual particles? Hmm. Well, let's try launching one atom at a time. And this time, we will put a detector on one of the slits that goes off every time it detects a particle. All right, yeah, looks like pretty much half of the atoms travel through the upper slit like they should, which means the other slit got the other half of the particles. Now let's have a look at where the atoms- What the f- Now the particles move like they should. So when we don't observe them, the particles move like waves, but when we do observe them, they move like particles? Okay. Well, what if we trick the atom and leave the detector there, but- this time we turn it off, so they will go through the detector, but we won't actually observe them. I mean, surely they would still behave like a particle and not light on the stereo essential. What the f- Basically, particles move like waves and not like particles, but the moment we start observing them, those bastards start behaving and move like particles like they should. Now, you might be asking yourself, Okay, 
Where's the conclusion? Why does why does this happen? What's the punchline? And the truth is, we have absolutely no fun people have, however, no, we do. come with different theories and interpretations of quantum mechanics. Let so we we do have some idea of why that happens. Um you know, yeah, there are different interpretations, which, he, which he's about to go into, but that has more to do with uh, the collapse of the wave function, um, which is related, definitely. But it's kind of clear in the double slit experiment what's really going on is when he was saying you put a detector there to detect the individual atoms. You're, you're destroying the wave-like properties of the atom by observing it. Because to observe it, you know, you're, you're interfering with... The, the particle itself. You can't observe it slash detect it unless, you know, you, you have light around or there's, you know, you're detecting something that's going to interfere with, you know, say you're using photon to go through the slit and you're trying to detect the photon. Whatever you do, you're going to interfere with it. That's why when you try to observe it, you destroy, you know, that wave-like pattern on the other side because you've destroyed its wave-like properties by trying to observe it. And, you know, that comes back to uh, quantum mechanics. And anyway, so that's really what's going on. But there is other interpretations as well. You know, in quantum mechanics, uh, these things, when you look at the actual math behind it, these things have a, a, a complex part. Uh, sorry, they're described with complex numbers. So there's a real part and an imaginary part. And so you can kind of imagine that when these particles, you know, go through one slit, you have the imaginary part interacting uh, or getting destroyed. When I say getting destroyed, I mean like constructive and destructive interference. Uh, anyway, we let's not try and explain this. It's going to take too long. But... Yeah, just know that what he said is, you know, it's not as mysterious as we can't, as it seems. You know, we're pretty sure that just by observing this stuff, you're destroying the wave-like properties. And this all changes again once you get the quantum field theory. There's a bit more to it again. And then what he's about to talk about is really interesting, these interpretations. But anyway, let's keep watching. Let's have a look at some of those. So, quantum mechanics are weird, and there are a bunch of different interpretations of quantum mechanics. Let's start with the most popular ones. 1. The Copenhagen Interpretation The Copenhagen Interpretation essentially states that particles travel through, like waves until they hit something, in which case they collapse back into the particle. The theory also explains the results of the double set experiment I explained earlier, since as soon as the particle hits something, a like a detector, it collapses from a wave into a particle. The Copenhagen interpretation is the most widely taught explanation to quantum mechanics, but one yep. question remains unanswered. How does it collapse from a wave into a particle? 2. The Many Worlds Interpretation Unlike the Copenhagen interpretation, the Many Worlds interpretation says that the particles don't collapse from waves to particles when measured, but instead, all possible outcomes of the particle's location happens in different timelines. This is pretty complex, but has some potentially wild implications. These two interpretations are currently the most popular interpretations of quantum mechanics, but there are also some more obscure ones, like hidden variable theories, which state that the quantum entanglement that one be possible. That one pretty much gone. And we also have cubism, also known under the more boring name quantum Bayesianism. We have quantum Darwinism, that one's cool. transactional interpretation, and a lot more that I won't get into. One of the Basically, big difficulties we have with no quantum idea. mechanics has been trying to link the world of quantum mechanics with the rest of physics. If you one day succeed and find a theory that works in both the quantum world and the classical world, we'll have a theory of everything. String theory is an attempt at just that. And here's an introduction. The nucleus of an atom is made of protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons are made from quarks. But then what? What is the quark made of? Well, string theory proposes that we could see particles not as colorful balls as they're often depicted as, but instead as strings. When we talk about particles, we often talk about them like they're points. But that doesn't really work well with mathematics. But what is more complicated than a zero-dimensional point? A one-dimensional line. A string. And this is where the idea of string theory comes from. Under the theory, particles will be strings vibrating at different frequencies, which determine what particle they are. Unfortunately, string theory requires 10 dimensions to work, and it makes it hard to actually function in practice. But the reason why researchers are still actively trying to make it work is because of how well the math works. 
If you find a way to make the string theory work, it would add gravity to quantum mechanics, something that has been incredibly hard to do, and we could perhaps finally have a theory of everything. There's I a lot mean, we could say there. Look at the math. And the previous stuff. It's, um... Yeah, it is very difficult. I mean, it's, de it's definitely something. I mean, it's just... Things in the universe tend to want to achieve a stable ground state. They want to have as little I'm just energy as possible. Zoning out. What Imagine was you have a ball on a hill. The ball's potential energy would be high, and so the ball would not be in a stable position. Pushing would just release its energy easily, but once it has reached a more stable place, okay. pushing the ball would just make it roll back. This tendency for things in the universe to want to reach a ground state is present pretty much everywhere, even for particle fields. Okay, let's come back to the ball example. Let's say the ball hasn't actually achieved the lowest possible state and is instead in a hollow on a slope. If you were to push it just slightly, it would roll back like usual, but if you pushed it harder, it would roll down even further. This phenomenon can happen in the world of particles as well, and is called metastability. Here is where it gets wild. You see, researchers think there's a That's chance meta, that we're living in a false vacuum. In other words, we live in a state where the quantum fields are not at their lowest point. If Love how he just chucks that in there, quantum fields. Maybe you should have... You know, talk about quantum fields. Less energy, it could trigger a chain reaction, and the area with the new vacuum state could start inflating. The consequences could be enormous. Some scenarios could still support galaxies, stars, and life, but some scenarios predict that it could mean a complete destruction of all matter, and maybe even cause the universe to implode. But don't worry, it can happen at any time without warning. Moving on. Sometimes, That's a real for thing. no reason, there's a random change of energy in a random point in space. This is called quantum fluctuation. Now, you might be saying, Well, that disobeys the laws of conservation of energy. Yeah, it actually doesn't. You can pause the video if you want to find out why. Anyway, this essentially results in a particle hopping into existence that is almost immediately cancelled out by its respective antiparticle before we can measure it. So it's this not really happening. It's called a virtual particle. Well, how do we know if they exist then? Well, the Casimir effect supports their existence. So, yeah, this isn't really what's happening. These virtual particles don't actually exist. Um, it's just like this mathematical construct that we use in particle physics to, you know, get the physics to work. It's just like a conceptual way of thinking about uh, the really complicated mathematics. Uh, it, they're, they're not actually real. So, sorry to break it to you. <laughs> and all the explanations that use them are simplified. So, it's like when Hawking describes Hawking radiation via virtual particles popping in and out of existence on, you know, the borders on the event horizon. That's not really what's happening. It's more to do with the wave-like uh, nature of particles. And it's, it's really not any more complicated. It's just not as, like, simple or, like, you know, just easy to understand. So I think that's why people like to feed you these lies. But anyway, virtual particles. One of the big results of these quantum fluctuations is... That's why they're called virtual. Say you're at your local bike hole just vibing, and then all of a sudden a photon... So yeah, when we say things popping in and out of existence, we're lying. ...there's due to quantum fluctuations. No big deal. It should disappear immediately before we are able to measure it. You think to yourself, before realizing that, oh no! The antiparticle that was supposed to cancel it out has unfortunately been absorbed by the black hole. The phenomenon that has just occurred is called Hawking radiation. The amount of energy emitted from the black hole just the Hawking radiation is lower than the amount it absorbs from cosmic radiation. It's not but in a very happening. long time, the black holes will likely start to evaporate completely due to Hawking radiation, and we will likely have what is called the heat death of the universe, where all energy is evenly distributed and nothing can happen. Luckily, supermassive black holes with a mass of one galaxy will take 10 to the power of 100 years to it's completely evaporate. Let's say we knew the position paradox. and speed of every single particle in the universe. Could we use this to figure out exactly what has happened in the universe prior to this point? No. The short answer is yes, since if we know everything no. about every particle, we would be able to calculate exactly how it got to that point. It's not true. However, that you might say... Quantum mechanics says you says no, okay? You can't do that. This assumes that every action that has happened can be calculated back to exactly one state. 
What if somehow an action had multiple prior states? Couldn't we force two particles onto the same state? Well, as PBS Space Time's Dr. Matt so wonderfully put it, Quantum mechanics forbids this. All information about a particle is encoded into its wave function. In other words, information about a particle is guaranteed to be conserved. This is what we say when we say that quantum information cannot be deleted. It is a pretty big part of quantum mechanics. Information is indestructible. Or is it? Calculations suggest it's more simple this than that. The reason you can't, if you had the position of every particle and you couldn't, why you couldn't, you know, just rewind the universe in a simulation is because of the uncertainty principle. There is randomness inherent to the universe, so you can't run it back because there's some random shit happening. Somehow disappear and get deleted in a black hole. This phenomenon is known in the scientific community as something that really does not make any f***ing sense. Why? Because we know black holes evaporate eventually. So if you know, if black holes are swallowing information uh, and then they just evaporate and disappear, it's like, where did that information go? It just literally disappeared and that violates the conservation of energy. But we're pretty sure what's really going on is that there's, you know, the black holes are getting that information back out potentially somehow. Um, you might have heard how black holes might have hair. Uh, this, you know, there's some theoretical stuff and ways by which it might happen. It's still unresolved. You keep seeing like things pop up, like it's resolved. You know, we figured it out. But until we can, you know, until there's an experiment or some kind of observation that verifies anything, you know, we don't know. Dark flow. According to the cosmological models of today, the movement of so everything sounds like Star Wars. Be distributed randomly. Can't wait for the new episode direction. of Obi Wan. There is, however, controversial evidence which suggests that the movements of these galaxy clusters is ever so slightly being pulled in a certain direction. This direction is calculated to be outside the observable universe. Digital physics is what we call theories that the universe can be described by information and that the universe can be seen as the output of a computer program. The implications of this is that everything, all your experiences, that's, that's, the entire world, I don't think will anyone really calls it digital physics. But yeah, information theory potentially is more fundamental, but it's completely theoretical. So, you know, this isn't taken very seriously by zeros. a lot of people. Calculations done by computer. Now, this might seem absurd and quite frankly unbelievable to you, but look at it like this. It is the chances cool. that theory is true might be low. But, since we currently have no way of finding out what the truth is, any theory could be correct. I mean, think about it. What was before the Big Bang? What did the universe start? We don't know. Speaking of crazy theories that probably aren't true and that sound completely unbelievable... Oh God. Here's a fun thought experiment. Imagine you're dead. Why is this level 6? Pretty hard, right? This is not. Asking someone to imagine they're dead is like saying, imagine you're not thinking right now. It's not really possible to do so, since imagining a loss of consciousness is not possible. I mean, it is possible. Ima Just imagine before you were born. There's your example. You can't. It's like, I mean, well, you can, but it's like, there's, there's nothing. That's... Imagine not being able to see, hear, smell, or feel anything. What about when but you go to sleep? at the end of the day, death is more than just a loss of your senses. It's the loss of your consciousness. If you die, you're not like, huh, looks like I'm dead. So, I thought when in you a way, sleep, you can't really be in a state that. and reflect upon your death. Okay, imagine you wake up in a room. Next to you is, a, let's say, a giant thermonuclear bomb. Okay, you say to yourself, guess I'll just leave this standard room. day. But then you look a, a little closer, find that the thermonuclear bomb is connected to a box, and inside the box is a measuring device that is observing a particle. Once the box is turned on, the spin of the particle is measured, and depending on the spin measured, you have a 50% chance of the bomb going off, instantly killing you, and a 50% chance of the bomb not detonating and being alive. Now wait a minute, you say, I'm Schrodinger's cat right now. Noticing the free opportunity of verifying that quantum immortality is real, you decide to press the button. 3, 2, 1, pause. You are currently in a superposition of being both dead and alive, and according to the multiverse interpretation, two new timelines are created. One where the bomb detonates and you instantly die, and one where the bomb doesn't detonate and you are alive. Let's unpause. Huh, 
Looks like you're alive. You decide to press the button again. <laughs> Nothing happened. At this point, there's a 25% chance you're alive. Okay, could still be lucky. So you decide to press the button 100 times. <laughs> yeah, don't try this at home. Okay, so what happened? Well, every time you pressed the button, two new timelines were created. One where you were dead and therefore unconscious, and one where you're not. From your perspective, the only possibility for you to exist and so have consciousness is for you to be alive. So for an outsider, the odds of them being alive in the exact same timeline as you are one in about this much. But from your own perspective, you cannot be in a timeline where you are dead because that would mean a loss of consciousness, which, as I described earlier, is not really possible. As a result, according to this theory, you always end up in a time life where you are alive and therefore conscious. Now, this theory is fairly controversial and has a lot of critique. It's not controversial, it's not a theory. This just comes from uh, what he talked about before, the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. And it's just silly. Like, it's not a theory or anything. It's just saying, you know, like, if you did this, you obviously you're going to die, you know, like, but on the odd chance, you know, you're in that one universe where you're right. Again, this is assuming there's many universes out there just like superimposed on top of each other. I don't think many worlds is a very good valid theory. theory With that said, please do not try this out as there's a good chance this isn't true. I mean, wow, looks like you act. All right. That was a good video. I enjoyed it, man. I thought he did a great job explaining all that stuff. Uh, I don't agree with the levels. I think, you know, there could be some work done there to change that. But I understand, you know, what he's going for. He's trying to get people to watch and, you know, that stuff at the end. It sounds cool. So, you know, I, I get it, man. It was a good video. He, like, obviously a lot of effort went into that. So, huge respect. Uh, well done. And, yeah, let, let me know down under, guys, if you have any ideas for things to react to. Follow me on Twitch. Uh, and yeah, I'll catch you guys next time. Peace.